Well, good morning. It's good to be back down on, uh, uh, here with y'all here at the Brooklyn Primitive Baptist Church. Uh, I was trying. I think I was trying to uh, worry Brother Danny because I got here a few minutes later than I did to. I don't know if he was worried about it or not, but uh, but I did make it in time. Uh, and I'm glad, just glad to be here. It's been a while since I've had opportunities to come and uh, visit with y'all, much less have the privilege to come and, and share God's word with you. As I was looking over my notes and my text uh, that I work off of uh, this morning, I noticed that I was having some problems as I uh, had recorded with, with some of my verbs, if you will, uh, keeping them straight, and I tried to straighten those out as best I could. And then I had some, noticed I had some problems with my pronouns, trying to keep them straight. So I ask you to uh, bear with me as, as, we, as I try to share this portion of God's Word with you. I will make one other comment here. I'll be reading from the book of Ezekiel. I'll be reading from Ezekiel 16 and 1. And as we look at that passage, it speaks of God, or God speaks of Jerusalem being uh, a baby. And then again, that Jerusalem is, what's the word I want to use? Well, the church is a type of Jerusalem. And we are that type of uh, baby. And I noticed I had used these terms that they all refer to the people of God. So with that disclaimer out of the way, if you will, read, uh, let's go to the Lord and then I'll, I'll read from Ezekiel chapter 16. Our God and our Father with chart in heaven, it is a wonderful thing that we can come into thy house again this day. And Father, as we've come, I pray that your presence will be with us. I pray that each and every one here has come with a prayerful heart, seeking to worship you. And Lord, just bless us with your presence. For Lord, without you, we cannot worship thee in any way. Now, Father, as we read thy word, I pray your blessings upon it. And Father, I pray your uh, the blessings will be upon those who, who hear what uh, you've allowed me to prepare. And I pray, for, Lord, again for the strength and the ability to uh, share what I have, what you have put on my heart. Now continue with us, O oh Lord, that we might praise thy name, and that the name of Jesus Christ might be honored and glorified through these words and through our worship this day. And it's in that name I do pray. And amen. Beginning reading, Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abomination. And say, Thus saith the Lord unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy, thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother was a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do, these, to do of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy per person in the day thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thy own blood, I said unto thee, when thou, when thou wast in the, in the blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. Thou hast increased and waxed great. Thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts were fashioned and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. 
Now I have passed thee by thee. Now, excuse me. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was in the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed thee, washed away thy blood from thee. I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also in broidered work, and shod thy feet, and shod thee with badger skins. I girded thee with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee unto the ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hand and a chain about thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thy ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thou wast, thus wast thou decked in gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk, and broidered work. And thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thou renowned went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect with my comeliness, which I put upon thee, saith the Lord God. As we look at this passage of scripture, uh, we see, uh, and not just to hear, we, throughout all of Ezekiel's writings, that Judah, and in this case, uh, in particular Jerusalem, was in trouble again. If you'll note the first word of the 16th chapter, it says again. Why? Because they have already, they have turned back to idolatry. And God through Ezekiel is calling upon these people to return unto him. In our scripture reading, the people are being reminded that they were, they were nothing before the Lord chose them. They were among the least of all nations. But God, and God through Ezekiel is here using the image of a newborn cast out baby that was unwanted, unloved, and comparing it to Jerusalem. So here we see this baby that has been found, it's been taken up, and it has been blessed greatly as it grew. And, and now this city has grown. Jerusalem at that time was apparently one of the greater cities of the known world uh, there in the Mediterranean area. And we can only say that it, God's activity in the life of Jerusalem as it grew can only be described as it grew by the grace of God. But there's another picture here. It's a picture that reveals God's grace to his people. Again, it shows that we were nothing until he found us and took us in. So the morning, this morning, I'm going to remind you, and you may say, well, Brother Ben, I don't need to be reminded. That's okay. I'm going to remind you anyway that you are what you are. I am what, what I am by grace. It comes from 1 Corinthians 5, 15 and 10. Remind you that grace is what has saved us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And that grace is what keeps us saved. Find that in 1 Peter 1 and 5. And that grace, living, uh, grace helps us day to day. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. So our picture there that we find in Ezekiel shows God's grace to us. But it does, it first shows us in our wretched condition. And I'm going to uh, uh, reference uh, Zechariah 3 and 4, where the high priest Joshua was put before God with the, uh, Christ there. 
and with the or devil sitting off to the side, the high priest Joshua was clothed in dirty, filthy clothes. And God put clean clothes on him and a mitre on his head. So that for us, we are now, we were clothed in filthy garments and we are now clothed with new raiment. But I want to look at verses 1 through 5 for a moment. In this, these verses, we find the wretched condition of this, this baby described. And in a parallel, it's a description of each one of us. Paul in Ephesians 2, uh, beginning in verse, uh, verse 1b, this is how he stated it. Speaking of us, who were dead in trespasses and sin, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in, ch in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past, in the flush, fl lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So I want to start with our wretched. We as this child, as it was found, were, one, were once unwashed and unclean. And our un uncleanliness is a result of sin. Adam's sin and our own. What did these sins do? They created a gulf between us and God. We were separated from him eternally without any desire to know God or believe on God. We were, in a sense, banished from his presence uh, to be punished with the ever, in the uh, everlasting destruction or, and separation from the presence of God and from the power, glory of his power. This infant, this infant needed a physical cleaning. We needed a spiritual cleaning. And furthermore, this child was also uncared for. Its um, 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 umbilical cord had not yet been cut. It was covered in blood. It had not been, been salted. It had not been swaddled. Its life was not cared for. It was apparently hated to the point that the parents attempted infanticide. And again, some of this was our condition in the world, hated and uncared for. In fact, David said in Psalm 142, no man cares for my soul. So we look back at this baby, it was also unswallowed. It was not wrapped. It had been left in a field to die, completely naked. It was left in the harsh elements of the world. And thus were we before God. We were, na we are, were naked in our disobedience and our sin. We were unable to hide from the Lord in our wretched condition. Hebrews 4 and 13 describes, describes us. It says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So all our sin and disobedience is in the eyes of God. We hide nothing from him. But this child, again, this child was unclaimed. She was unwanted. Neither parent would, would take responsibility for it. So this, this poor, helpless little child had been left to its own devices, just as we are in our sinfulness. It was orphaned. It was orphaned. And we were alone in this world without God. We were orphans in a sense. Ephesians 2 and 12 illustrates what we were in this way. Paul writes there, that in the time ye were without Christ, we were orphans without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. <coughs> now we may have had friends, we may have had family around us, but we were without God in the world. What did we need? We needed a relationship with our near kinsman, kinsman Jesus Christ. And who provided that relationship? Jesus provided that relationship. Christ, Christ had to be the one. He was the only one who could provide that relationship. Because as far as we were concerned, we were like lost sheep. We had no control over our situation. We look back at what Ezekiel wrote. We find that this abandoned but newborn was powerless to change its situation. And again, we were powerless to change our own. In fact, we didn't know we needed a change. Nor did we care. We were getting along just fine. And in a sense, we were dead and we needed resuscitation. Or we needed, to use a more biblical word, we needed quickening. And Paul, in Ephesians 2 and 1, tells us about us. And you, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now all of us, by our inheritance from Adam, were like this baby. We were helpless to help ourselves. And like this baby, we were doomed. The baby was doomed to die in that field. And we were doomed to an eternity in hell. We all needed help. But what happened? We look back at verse 6 of Ezekiel 16. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Now the Lord is speaking of himself as the one who was passing by. For this baby, as this is written, is this seems to be a chance passing by. But folks, I want you to know that God does nothing by chance. There is no, there, there's no just passing by with the Lord. His, the plans that he has for us will take place in his time. We look at John 6 and 44 where we see that God comes to us First, that baby didn't come to the man, to the one who passed by. The man came to the, the baby. John 6 and 44, no man, this is Jesus' words, no man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. The Father initiated the contact. And I will raise him up at the last day. The Father is the one who seeks and saves. There is no one that has a desire to seek him out. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in spite of our sins, has compassion on those who came to seek and save. And in that compassion, he rescues the abandoned newborns. He takes them in and he loves them. And he covers their crimson sins with robes of white linen that they, that we might have life. He commands us to live in that he has given us everlasting life through the shedding of his precious blood. This child then was claimed, it was covered, and it was adopted. 
and it was by adoption that this child became a member of this man's family who found it in the field. For us, we have been adopted. We have been legally made a member of the family of God. And he has made a covenant for us. That's one correction that I have made. I changed that from contract to covenant. You realize that a contract can be broken. Whereas God's covenant, and notice that I said he made a covenant for us, not with us, but God's covenant is eternal, it's binding, and we are, as we look at 1 Peter 1 and 5, kept by the power of God through faith under salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. And then we look at the words of Jesus. He says, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So we continue reading. We get down to verse 9. I'm not going to read it audibly here. It tells us that we are washed and that we are cured. Referencing Isaiah 8, 1, uh, 1 and 18, we have been washed whiter than snow. In other words, all of our filthiness has been cleansed by the washing of the blood of Jesus. The anointing that's spoken of there, well, for the baby, it was medical. There was a medical reason for it to be anointed. But for the elect, the anointing is a curing of our sinful nature, making us new creatures fit to serve God. And for, and, and for us spiritually, it's a concentrate, concent, consecration. It's a setting apart. We are set apart as the temples of the living God, consecrated unto the glory of the Lord. Therefore, according to verses 10 through 14, changes have been made for this formerly exposed infant. Now again, I remind you that this writing is to Jerusalem at the time of its writing. But it has been preserved for us. But wonderful changes have been made for that child. Wonderful changes have been made for Jerusalem. Wonderful changes have been made for us. We have grown, the child Jerusalem, and us, we have all grown. And then we look at verse 10, we, uh, it gives us a description of the beauty of the finest of clothing. It speaks of the outward appearance of this child who has grown as, as beauty, it, it's as if a bride has been adorned with jewels for her wedding. But for you and I, for the children of God, we have been adorned with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Every saint of God has been made comely by his grace and power. This formerly wretched child has now grown, referencing verse 12. She has grown in stature, she has grown in beauty, and has been crowned by the one, uh, the one who found her, making her his own for the saints of God, the church, which has been made the bride of Christ. We have been crowned with his glory. We have been saved by grace with the promise of a home which G Jesus went to prepare. Verse 14. And thy renown went forth among the heathen, the heathen for thy beauty. For it was perfect through my comeliness which I put upon thee, saith the Lord God. The renown and the beauty that the Lord is speaking of is not of the child. It's not of the, the woman the child has grown to. Nor is it the beauty of Jerusalem. It is not of ourselves, our beauty. But it is, it is of the Lord's comeliness. He bestowed that comeliness upon them and he bestowed it upon us. And it's through this bestowal that we have been changed. 
the child Jerusalem, the church, the saints of God. None of us were loved. None of us were wanted. None of us were cared for. But God, aren't you thankful for that phrase? But God, according to his, the good pleasure of his will, chose to love us when we were unlovable. And in his love, he wanted us and he has cared for us. And in that love, he has again made us new creatures. We are different than what we were before. Now, I would love to start my conclusion here. But I can't. Because I read verses 15 through 64 or 65. And it was shocking. Not the first time I'd read it, but as I read it and studied it this way, it was shocking. And I'm taking, I take it as a personal warning. And it should be a warning to the church of God and the earth. Now I'm going to read verse 15 in just a moment. And if you want to, and if you decide to read it later, I'm going to tell you that verse 15 begins by telling of the betrayal of Jerusalem as it turned from God into wickedness, wickedness and abomination. But thou distrust in thine own beauty and playest the harlot because of thy renown and pourest out thy fornications on everyone that passed by, his it was. So if you, if you decide to read verses 15 through 63, I warn you that this is a very ugly picture. There are, there, there are points of light in it, but it's a very ugly picture. But I remind you that Jerusalem was and is God's chosen city. But it was a city that would soon fall here in history at this time because of the sin and disobedience of the people. <coughs> and beloved, if that great city could fall for those reasons, so can we. We can fall. Even as the elect of God, we can fall. This does not mean we will lose our salvation. Our salvation cannot be taken away from us. But what can be removed is the joy of our salvation. If you remember David, because of his sin, lost the joy of his salvation and he prayed that the joy of salvation be returned to him. So I must say again, the joy of our salvation can and will be taken away because of our sin and our wickedness and our abomination, just as it has been taken away from Jerusalem. Brooklyn Church, beloved, God took innumerable, unwanted, unlovable, sinful people and he chose to love them and he saved them by his grace he made them his own our savior jesus christ went to the cross that he might go and prepare a place for us to prepare a place in heaven for his own and will and one day in his time return for his people that where he is we may be also Yes, I'm thankful that God loves his people. I'm thankful that he loves us even while we are yet sinners as we live on the earth. But you know, I can't remember chapter and verse. Spoil, spare the rod and spoil the child. Our Lord will chastise us when we go wrong. But the other end of that is that he will restore us when we turn back to him. He is a forgiving God. And he will forgive us just as the Father 
was forgiving in the parable of the prodigal son. And even as the joy of Jerusalem was eventually restored after the 70 or so years of captivity. My prayer this morning, Father, help us to remember all the good you've done for your people. Bless us that we do not fail in our faithfulness to you, even as you will never fail in your faithfulness to us. But Father, if we do in some way fail and fall away, Lord, turn our hearts back to you that we might come before you with repentant and thankful hearts and that we might rejoice in you and rejoice in the joy of our salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. And amen. Brother Danny. As we sing our hymn of invitation, if there's any here that the Lord has touched your heart previously or even this morning, then would you like to make the Brooklyn Primitive Baptist Church your home? We invite you to come. <laughs>